Um, the project that I'm working on is multitask reinforcement learning using dendrites. And um, so just as a refresher of what reinforcement le learning is as kind of a five bullet crash course, if that's possible. Um, um, so basically the, the goal of reinforcement learning is that there's an agent that exists in a stochastic world. Um, formally, like mathematically, this is defined by something called a Markov decision process where there's the easiest way to think about it is there's like discrete states and uh, the agent takes an action and this transitions the agent into another state uh, in a stochastic way. At every transition after taking an action, the agent receives a reward, which is like a scalar value. And the goal of the agent is to, uh, is to maximize the expected total reward over either the enti entire agent's lifetime, which could be infinite, or um, typically it's over a fixed time horizon. So say uh, it, over 200 steps or something like that. The reward is structured, so it rep represents success on a certain task. So for example, in like a chess scenario where you have an agent that is trying to learn to play chess, the simplest way would be to have a reward of one for a win, a reward of zero for a draw, and the reward of minus one for a loss. Um, you could also have more complex rewards. Uh, so what I just call, mentioned is called a sparse reward because you only get the reward at the completion of, or the determination of the game. Um, you could also have something called a dense reward where um, you basically get a meaningful signal at every single time step. So for example, if you capture a piece, you could get a reward or based on the position, you could get a reward and that, that ultimately should guide you towards winning the game. Um, the latter, if the reward is designed correctly, is typically a lot easier because um, you're kind of guided towards success rather than just having to happen upon it once or twice before realizing that you've succeeded. So the way that actions are computed is that the agent receives an observation, um, also called a state vector, and it outputs an action vector. Um, so and depending on the scenario, the action vector could either be like a discrete action. So um, if it has like five choices, which choice it takes, or in a lot of other examples like robotics, it could be a continuous vector, um, like the joint positions or torques or something like that. Uh, the distinction between normal RL and deep RL is that um, the action function is represented by a deep neural network. There's also other neural networks um, that are associated with it, such as value functions, but um, that's not really, that's more inherent to RL algorithms and less so just over overall reinforcement learning. Akash, can I, can I just add something? Um, yeah, go for it. So the reward on bullet two and three, it can either come from the environment, which would be the supervised reinforcement learning, or it could also be an, what we call an intrinsic reward, like the agent generates its own reward that would be a sort of unsupervised reinforcement learning. So mm -hmm. Akash's project is towards, uh, more towards supervised reinforcement learning, and Vivian's project is towards unsupervised uh, reinforcement learning. So there's a distinction there. Yeah, that's a great point, Lucas. And typically, if it's unsupervised reinforcement learning, the, the intrinsic reward is used to kind of explore the environment um, and be, and then, build that up towards maximizing some sort of external reward downstream. Um, so this is like a pretty good example of um, something that's doing reinforcement learning training. So here, uh, this robot is learning to pick up and move these items into this box. Um, and the way it does it is initially it has like a random or exploration policy where it's just taking random actions to see what the world is about. And then um, hopefully after a few updates, it kind of happens upon moments of high reward and then it kind of gravitates towards this. Um, so what's multitask reinforcement learning? It's very similar to normal reinforcement learning, um, except instead of the agent optimizing for a single task, the agent's trying to get good at multiple tasks. Um, so. Uh, some important distinctions here is that the agent knows which task it has to solve. It has like a task ID as part of the observation. And typically in uh, these, these scenarios, 
the tasks share the observation and action space. So what the agent sees for all the tasks is like the same sort of data type. So the same dimensional vector representing the same kind of information and it executes the same type of action. So um, if it executes joint torques for act task one, it will also execute joint torques for ta task two. Where the tasks differ is typically in the reward function. Uh, so here, this is a pretty good example of a multitask setting where you have the same robot arm um, in the same type of world trying to do three different things. Um, so here it's trying to press a button. Here it's trying to open a window and here it's trying to pick up this peg and insert it into this, uh, this hole. And like I mentioned, the observations it receives for each of these three tasks will be similar. Um, which I'll get into in, in, in the future because I'm actually using this environment. And the actions are also similar. It could be like joint angles. Uh, but now like for button press, the reward signal will be constructed so that it indicates success in that task. Whereas for window opening will be a different reward signal that indicates how well it's doing in that task. So the, the reason why, a couple of reasons why multitask learning and multitask reinforcement learning is difficult. Um, I think there's two main ones. Um, the first is gradient interference. So this is more of like a mathematical reason. And the reason is that, so if you look at each, if you're trying to optimize each task individually, you can imagine there being some sort of loss landscape. Um, where, for example, here, this is from a paper from 2020 analyzing multitask learning. Here you have two tasks. Um, this could be the lost landscape for task, task one, where these kind of dark contours represent a valley and say you're trying to minimize the loss. So anywhere along this part for task one will be good. And for task two, you have a different landscape, which is like this. And if you uh, sum the losses, because you're trying to optimize for both tasks, then you get this um, multitask objective, which is in 3D on part A and then kind of contoured on part D. Are, so these, are these actually, um, these tasks really can be represented by two variables, these two thetas, or is this really a much more higher dimensional space and you're just- so This is more of like a, a toy uh, example to demonstrate. Well, so, there, so we're talking about high dimensional spaces here and this is just an illustration. Yeah, this is just an illustration. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the dimensionality could be thousands or millions. Well, that's what I thought, but I, it, was, it looked more specific, you know, theta one, theta two, and I was like, like, oh, is this really, maybe there's just two, two degrees of freedom here. No, there's more degrees of freedom. Like there's, there's a lot of. Yeah, this okay. is just an example the authors yeah. came up with to kind of illustrate their point. Yeah, okay. Um, so if you look at plot D, where you have the sum of the two task objectives, ultimately you want to get to that top slice where the kind of the valleys overlap uh, per se, because now you're at a, a region where both you're, you're optimized for both tasks. However, if you're at this point, can you guys see my mouse by the way? Yeah. Okay, cool. If you're at this point here, um, the gradient for task two is dominating or task one is dominating over the gradient of task two. Um, basically this red arrow is the task one gradient and the blue arrow is the task two gradient. So then if you take the sum of these, then you're going to go somewhere this way, where now you're just not optimizing for either gradient. And this paper kind of further analyzes the properties that make this kind of difficult, but I think this conveys the intuition. Um, so there's interference of gradients between different tasks. The second big challenge um, is represent representational capacity. So of course you could just train a different policy for each task and I'm sure you're, like that's the best option. But the challenge of multitask learning is that you're trying to have one policy or one neural network that should be able to represent all these modes of behavior. So in the previous slide, it should be able to open the window and open, uh, insert the peg and press the button um, depending on what it's told to do. And it should be able to do these distinctly, but also find kind of, because there's a limit on the capacity, it should be able to find overlap in different tasks. So like for, if there's a similarity in certain parts of the movement for 
pushing a block and um, pressing a button, it should be able to kind of recognize this and uh, take advantage of it. So I think this is also a, an, 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 an interesting point because uh, like Karan and Subutai and several other, others here are like working on continual learning. So continual learning also has the notion of solving multiple tasks. The primary difference here is that A, the agent knows which task to solve uh, and B, it receives data on all the training tasks at any given point in training. So um, from like a machine learning point of view, if you're if you have a batch of data, this batch will contain data from each of the tasks. Whereas in continual learning, you see task one first, then you see task two, then you see task three, and you're trying to evaluate at any given time how well you're doing on the tasks you've seen in, in your lifetime. Um, so, so the good thing here is So that is there a notion of a continual multitask learning? Because you could easily it seems to me like you could make this into a continual learning problem too, where you learn to first press a button. Um, and then after a while you, you switch to learning how to do a door, open a door, but you're not simultaneously trying to learn how to press a button anymore. Yeah. I think it could be easily yeah. adapted to that setting um, where you're, you're basically fixing the number of time steps you see each time. But then that just becomes continual learning, right? Yeah. That, that would be the transition from one mode to another one. Yeah, except it would be in a reinforcement learning scenario. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that would be a, a different benchmark, but it would be like pretty easy to adapt like the, the meta world environment, which I'm talking about to that. So I think the, the good thing is that continual learning also faces the challenges in the previous slide, specifically like gradient interference and um, representational capacity. The one extra challenge in continual learning is more of kind of explicit catastrophic forgetting where you need to remember patterns in data that you just haven't seen in a long time. So in a sense, multitask learning is an easier problem than continual learning, but it's kind of on the, on the way towards continual learning if continual learning is the ultimate goal, which is kind of why I, I was interested in this problem. So the environment I'm using to study this is called MetaWorld. Um, it's a robotic manipulation environment where you have this six degree of freedom robot, um, which is basically interacting with different objects on a table. And each task represents some sort of different manipulation thing. So this is a 50 task scenario. Um, and every, every single task is outlined. I think the nice thing about this compared to like say supervised multitask where maybe you're trying to recognize different pieces of an image or um, yeah, like some, some other multitask scenario is that here there's a lot of similarity in structure across the tasks. Your robot is basically in the same type of environment. It's seeing very similar types of data um, and it outputs very similar types of actions. So there's a lot of overlap it can take advantage of ideally. Um, the only thing that differs is the kind of manipulation task it has to do, which is represented by the task ID and the reward signal that kind of guides the robot towards the task. Gosh, are these tasks, is there any variability in them? Like when it closes the window, is the window in different locations at different times and the robot arm starts in different locations or is it pretty much a defined, like everything is precise? That's a good question. Um, in fact, this in this environment, like for within each task, the starting position and the goal positions of the objects can be changed, uh, which so I'll that, talk about in like a- Okay, that's the assumption. So there's there's inherent variability in every task. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah, so the details here are that um, there's two benchmarks, one with 10 tasks or one with 50 tasks. The robot observes, um, the, it's, a, it's not an image, it's a, it's a lower dimensional vector. So basically the object position for whatever object of interest there is, the gripper position of the robot, whatever goal position the um, robot is trying to get the object into, as well as the task ID. And how much variation, take object position, you know, there's a lot of, 
the, the like six, you know, orientation and location is it like six degrees of freedom now? Is it more simple than that? For for like the t variation within each task? Well, like object position, right? I mean, I'm just wondering how much variation is for an object position. You know, if I'm picking up the peg to stick it in the hole, can the peg be in any location? Can it be up and down? Can it be at different orientations lying on its side? Or is it more like, oh no, it's just in one of these X, Y positions? In theory, it could be like in whatever, but in the environment, they, they have a fixed set of possible positions and okay. it randomly samples one of those. Okay. Uh, the, the, the action that the robot outputs is the end effector position. And the reward is dense, meaning it's not like a one if it succeeds and a zero if it fails at the task. It's, um, it, it's kind of guided towards the goal. So if I go back to the previous slide, for example, if it's, um, if it's, for example, pressing the button, like the, the reward could be like how close you are to the button. If you touch the button, you get some reward. And then if you press the button, you get the most reward, but there's a reward that kind of indicates how close you are to succeeding. And then um, as Jeff just, just mentioned, uh, with, within each task, the object and goal position can differ. Um, the environment, like the way they de the developers developed it was so that there's like a fixed amount of variability for each task, but there's enough to prevent the agent from being like, it's, there's enough so that the agent doesn't memorize each task. And the gripper position, is it fixed? The, the gripper position? Yeah. Well, the what gripper position is the robot hand, so that's the thing. Well, or, but maybe the gripper state, does the gripper actually open and close? Yeah. But, I, I mean, oh, sorry. Right, right. But my question is right. not whether like if it's open or close. My question is where does the gripper start, right? Because one thing it's you, you vary the object position, okay. Uh, you also change the goal position, okay? But what, what about where do you start? Where the arm oh, start? Like, oh, like where's your arm at rest? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I can double check, but I I think when I read the paper, they didn't mention anything about the gripper starting position changing. Okay, so so the assumption is the gripper is always going to start like at that fixed place. That's yeah, like a kind of over the object. Okay. All right, now, now, my question is, does the gripper actually grip or is it just like, does it actually move? Because <laughs> it's not, there's no robot observation of that. So I didn't, you know, does it actually have to pinch and pick something up? Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. So that's another observation, the state of the gripper. Yeah. Or the action could also be gripper, gripping or not gripping. Right, right. It wasn't it's the position and like whether you close or open. Okay. So, so it's just Boolean, like whether it's closed or open, there is no touch here, right? Like no force, strength, and all that. No, I don't think so. Okay. So the reason why the it's not like an image-based setup um, or like more simple is so that from an actual like it's actually possible to solve each task individually. So solving each task individually is not super super difficult. The challenge comes from the fact that there's multiple tasks. Um, so I think the developers wanted to make it so that the challenge is in a, a mostly mul a multitask challenge rather than each task being super hard already kind of issue. So the way I'm looking at the, uh, I, I'm, I guess the direction I'm taking with this project is um, can dendritic networks be used to achieve strong performance in multitask reinforcement learning. Specifically, can the type of contextual gating that we use in dendrites be used to mitigate against some of the challenges, specifically gradient interference and also um, like is the structure of the dendrites a good one in terms of the capacity for, for multitask learning? So several related questions here are what's the role of sparsity, both activation and weight sparsity and what's important for practical uh, dendritic performance. So the current approaches that I've been uh, working on is um, 
uh, several different context signals. So the first being um, the one, like a one hot task ID vector. And what, what I mean by this is if, for example, there's 10 tasks and you're trying to solve task one, the like zero at the index of this vector of a 10 dimensional vector would be one and the rest are zero. Um, another idea that I was working on, I've been working on is um, kind of processing the task ID and the observation at, at any given time and su summarizing that into one vector um, and using that as a context. So those are several approaches there. Could you, what's the one hot, one hot task ID vector? What does that mean? Yeah, so it's it's like if you have um, one hot. It's ID. just a unary encoding of the task. So if oh. task two is what you're doing, then that that vector, that component is oh. one, everything else is zero. I see, got it. Yeah. yeah. All right, but that's a very simple context. <laughs> got it, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been using one dendritic segment for computational efficiency, which uh, has been one of the main challenges of the project is the efficiency of the dendrites. And then um, also investigating weight sparsity. Um, so far it has not really hurt performance and preliminarily well, that, seems to be uh, better. If you have one dendritic segment, how's that different than a point norm? I mean, I'm, maybe I'm missing something there. I mean, so I think the, so I think it would be very similar to a point neuron, except the kind of benefit here is that each neuron is getting gated based on the contextual signal. I think ideally- Oh, oh I see. Oh, I see. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I got it. It's our, uh, yeah, I got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the trick here, <laughs> the reason one dendritic segment works is because it's a one hot encoding. And so you can actually, one dendritic segment is just as good as having 10 dendritic segments because you can just have yeah, the unit of whatever you need in that, on that got segment. Got got so that was kind of the, okay. the, the kind of a realization. Yeah, it, uh, yeah so, I, and I forgot, basically this, the dendritic segment is not activating the neuron, it's just writing them. It's getting, but this is just getting. as good as, with one hot encoding, the number of segments yeah. doesn't matter. One yeah. segment is enough. I got it, I got it. Yeah, but it's an important to note that I've mostly moved away from using one hot as like the direct context. I'm more using this um, dense vector that's coming out of an MLP. Um, yeah, then the number of segments will make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, in terms of K-winner activations, the initial results have not been as promising. And um, the reason for this is still a little bit up in the air, um, but I've been mostly looking at weight sparsity and then trying to improve the results with one dendritic segment. For the training on the K winners, are you using any kind of boosting uh, heuristic? No, uh, no explicit boosting. So the thought process there was that the dendritic kind of gating would do the boosting mechanism on its own. Um, because if it, like it would each, the segments would either be, have the power to turn off or turn on a unit. And so it would either increase the chance of that unit being in the top K or not being in the top K. So is there going to be a natural, um, filtering effect, uh, where only a few of the, uh, one hots have a dominant effect? Uh, what do you mean by a few of the one hots having a dominant effect? Well, if you're saying the gating mechanism is, is through the dendritic segment, part of the mm -hmm. reason for boosting was that uh, uh, at some point, the um, uh, things feeding into the K winners, uh, their weights dropped to the point where they fell off and they never came back again. So the network started sparsifying prematurely. So uh, I'm not familiar enough with the gating mechanism to know if that actually is, is dealt with, uh, that, that particular um, degradation is dealt with. Okay, uh, I'm not quite sure if that happens in the dendritic, in the dendritic scenario, but yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, it, it can definitely happen. 
So boosting is, at least in continual learning, boosting is something we haven't really resolved yet because boosting can also hurt continual learning. Um, but, uh, but Kevin, your point is a, totally valid here. It could, you, you could have a situation where a few units are constantly being activated and the rest, there are some units that are never being used. I, it could happen, but then again, this is not continual learning as in, in each epoch, we're gonna see all tasks. So it would be harder to happen than as in a continual learning scenario. No, no, we, we saw it happen. No, no, it, we definitely saw it happening in non-continual learning cases. That's why we put in boosting. Got it. Um, but in continual learning, we've turned off boosting because boosting can hurt continual learning. Uh, for, we have to, that's a, it's like one item we still have to investigate. Right. So maybe a different heuristic than what we used uh, in the uh, in the CNNs, maybe for boosting. I mean, I, I'm just thinking that if 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 it, it's kind of like you uh, find a uh, a false minimum and you basically simplify the whole network down to some point, yeah. and it can't get any better. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's something you could um, look at, and uh, Akash, even without K winners, you could still get that that some units are. Well, I guess without K winners, it'll be a little harder, but with K winners, you can definitely get the case where just a small number of units are becoming active and the rest are never becoming active. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's a, definitely something to take a look at. So uh, some of the progress in the project is like the, the major code base is set up and integrated with popular RL libraries. That was done a little while ago. Um, we have we had initial promising re results on uh, the ten task scenario, um, where the dendrites were getting with just one segment were getting really strong results. And so far, I've been working on setting up the uh, experimental setup for both ten and fifty tasks with several different popular RL algorithms. The main challenge is that. Uh, I've been facing are the speed of experimentation. So RL experiments already take a long time. For example, like with small MLPs, the experiments already take at least a day usually um, to, to run co to completion. Um, but with dendrites, which have many more parameters than the MLP networks, this scales up quite a bit. Um, so one of the challenges there has been a kind of can we make dendrites more efficient in terms of the number of parameters and B, um, can we optimize the, the code setup for this and um, C, kind of finding a early stopping point that we can stop experiments at, to, but still are a good indicator of future success or performance. And another one is the, is the fact that because in reinforcement learning, there's a lot of different moving parts, for example, how well the agent ex is exploring the environment and um, the, the data is kind of being collected in an online way. So there's a lot of different uncertainty in what kind of data the agent is seeing. So it's just one of the difficulties is figuring out what the failure modes are in when things don't work and um, kind of tracking the relevant statistics and logging the relevant information to help find this. And these are the, couple of the things that mostly have been presenting the most challenges. When you say the uh, preliminary results were, were promising for the 10 test scenario, uh, how, how is that measured? Like, is, what's the basic metric for that success? Yeah, so um, and for each- show, I don't know if you're gonna show that or not. Yeah, for each task, there's like a, a notion of success or failure. So if it's like pushing the button, if you, if you achieve that goal, then you get, um, then you succeeded. And so like for each of the tasks, the, uh, the agent is, you, you do try each task many times and then you see how, how, how often you succeed in solving. So we're, have, are we comparing this to other implementations that aren't able to do that? Or uh, what's, what's the, how do we know how we're doing relative to existing? Oh yeah, so there's, there's been a, a few different works that have their own methods. So like, I guess the kind of independent variable here is the type of network that is being used. So 
the base, the kind of more most basic comparison point would be a normal feed forward network. And um, the dendrites have been shown to be better than that. Um, and there's like a different type of architecture that was proposed like last year, which is state of the art. So in the 10 task scenario, the dendrite networks get uh, like pretty much match the results of that uh, of that work. Um, but in the 50 test scenario, it hasn't quite. So those are those are the two points. So so uh, promising results basically means that we're we're at par of, of uh, with or close to par with um, this other techniques at this point. Yeah. Is that, you know, w would we hope or expect to exceed those? I think we could. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think we could like in, so the, the kind of the best results also use a type of gating mechanism, but at a much higher level. So in theory, like our dendritic networks, because they're doing gating at a per, per unit level can achieve the same thing. Um, but kind of finding the right way to optimize the dendritic networks to do that is probably the biggest challenge. Mm. I mean, do these, do these other scenarios actually solve the problem in some sense? If, you know, are we at 99%, you know, for the 10 test scenario, if we're, we're meeting that, or is it, um, is it still an unsolved problem? So I think in the, in the 10 test scenario, um, to pick like a lot of methods get up to like solving 80% of the tasks, so like eight out of the 10 tasks it's able to solve. In the 50 task scenario, it's still unsolved in that like it's hard to get past 50% of the tasks. So like only 25 yeah. out of the 50 tasks are being solved. But even 80% even is leaves room for improvement too. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, we should be shooting for 100%, really, right? Because brains can do that. Yeah. I, I think um, in the 10 task, we do nine out of 10 rata crash, like 90%. Uh, sometimes we get to nine out of ten, but consistently eight. And and there's there differences in the time of training or efficiency in other ways. Is it you know? So I think our ways are less efficient in terms of time of training, mostly because of the number of parameters. So mm -hmm. um, basically, because each there's like a like a gating signal for each unit. Um, there's many more parameters in the network, which kind of increases the number of samples needed to be trained. Um, and in terms of time, this is also a slowdown. So uh, just from my perspective, um, the biggest challenge here, it's kind of uh, code related, infrastructure related. Uh, we don't, the code's not fast enough in order to write it fast and look for good uh, hyperparameters and test new ideas. It's just taking a long time to write it. And we are working on that, trying to make the code more effective. Mm. The, these libraries, they're not so uh, well, um, they're not like standards, like we have in supervised learning with PyTorch or Hugging Face. These are small libraries. There's still a lot of issues in them. So we have to do a lot of a lot of the work ourselves. It's a, it's a bit more challenging than the other projects we have uh, been working so far. But the results for the 10 tasks were actually pretty good because we're on pair and sometimes better than, than the state of the art. Just on the 50 task, we weren't able to replicate that uh, success yet. But that's still a work in progress. It is, yeah. But the biggest challenge again is that so it took nine days to run uh, one 50 task. Wow, sorry. And because we can't, <laughs> just because we can't, uh, it's not parallelized uh, well, we can't run it across multiple instances. So it's really a matter of uh, infrastructure, getting it into place uh, so we can iterate faster and, and just move do, faster. Right do we now. have a plan for solving the speed issue? Uh, we do. I'm, I'm, uh, just both of Crash and me are uh, actively working on it. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to do it in such a, a short time frame. But yeah, we're, we're trying. Okay, we have ideas on how to speed that up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think both Akash and Lucas are being a little bit modest and careful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, 
to keep in mind when we started, we had no idea whether this was going to work at all. Um, and uh, I think Akash identified this kind of area, which you know I hadn't thought about. Maybe Lucas had already thought about. And it seems like a really good fit for dendrites. And these are just like, like really just very preliminary results. I would say mm. we haven't done. We're not really exploiting sparsity properly here. Uh, there's a lot of tweaking and tuning yeah, that we haven't seems, done. And it seems like partly the, because it's so slow. Yeah, um, it seems like this one dendrite. And what was the term you called that hot something or other? <laughs> um, that that kind of throws away a lot of the pop, uh, benefits of, of sparsity, and, and uh, it's hard to know what would happen in that scenario. The, the one hot encoding, right? But we are not yeah. using the one hot encoding. That was just that were just the initial experiments, but we've moved away from that. So we. But are... if you but but isn't a, a single dendrite tied to that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so that that was uh, I had I hadn't fully realized that until you guys said that. But the one dendrite segment would be very limiting if we're not using. Uh, one hot encoding from a yeah. capacity point of view. And yeah. you know, I understand that it gets much slower. That's the challenge here. Yeah, so the speed is forcing us to implement a network structure, which is far from ideal. Um, uh, so we have to keep that, just not to forget that. To get the benefits is you have to have, you really want sparsity and multiple dendrites. So, um, okay. So, so I have a uh, one question uh, on the uh, boosting for continuous learning. Um, so right now, without boosting, uh, a weight, even if it was initially not part of, if it was a, initially a non-zero, could be driven down to zero by by training, right? So, I'm just wondering what if, what, what could uh, I'm sorry, what could be driven down to zero? Weight. Yeah, yeah, it can be. Okay, so let's hypothesize that uh, when you- But it can uh, also be increased. It doesn't have to be driven down to zero. Right, right. I'm, I'm trying to handle the case where uh, it gets driven uh, down to zero. So you could imagine that you, you started off with some set of tasks and that thing was, uh, that particular weight was useless for that. And so the gradients drove it down to zero, but what you could do instead was kind of, uh, rather than let it go down to zero, do a phase where you say, how much could I increase it without adversely affecting my outcome and leave it at that threshold. So that if something comes along with a new task, it's not starting from zero and being dead. It actually is sitting almost potentiated so that it could actually come back and contribute. Well, I think with the dendrites and K winners, we can do even better than that, which is we just don't even touch the weights that are not relevant. Um, you know, so if you only have 5%, you have 95% activation sparsity, that means, you know, the 95% of the weights are not going to get touched for a given, because the, the activation will be zero and the gradients will just get blocked right there. Okay. So, okay. So you actually, least so so what's the train uh, so what changes do you allow for the weights then only the ones that actually become active the only the units that become active only those weights will will change so the idea is that, and so you don't get as much gradient interference so the, the chart that uh akash showed earlier where all these tasks are interfering with one another mm -hmm. um, because you're just trying to do a like a trying to optimize a whole bunch of things simultaneously. You're not, you're trying to, with dendrites, you avoid that. You have, uh, you know, really sparse subnetworks that be ideally should become specialized to specific tasks or specific combinations of tasks. And then when you're doing something else, they just don't get touched. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm just looking at it for the initial set of tasks. If, if the, if, if the, um, I see. So you're, you're, you're basically saying they, if, if the weights are not participating, they're just going to be gated away. They're not actually going to be trained down to something, to, to zero, right? So they right. Sit, sit, okay. But if they become uh, active through the activation, then um, do you, you allow them both to go up and, and down? Yep, yeah. So if they go down, uh, uh, for that particular task, 
does that mean that if you have another task where they could have participated, they're going to be that much less likely to they, be able to yeah, do anything? Yeah, so there could still be, yeah, so there could still be some interference, but it's much less than before. Um, okay, so I'm just when you get, I'm just, yeah, I'm just looking at looking at the case where um, the things are being driven down by the gradients, but it's being driven down is not actually contributing a lot to the actual loss function. It's just being driven down because it's it's doing credit assignment. I'm just wondering if there's a, a way to, you know, restore it back up to where it's just barely, you know, affect the the credit score, even if it's not. I don't know. It, it was it was it's just the idea that uh, that that if if you've driven something down, you know, far enough because of uh, one particular task, it might never recover. Yeah, that, that, can, that can certainly happen, um, but it would be much, much less likely to happen um, in these very sparse act, sparsely activated networks. Yeah, and, and then if it does, on the so there's like a capacity a issue. Yeah, so there's a capacity issue. Now, if some subsets are being used for multiple tasks and there is interference, there are a couple of possibilities to you know, to help with that. Um, so multiple dendritic segments will naturally help, um, but there are some other techniques like synaptic, like more complex synapses and stuff that can help there too. Right. And, and right. we can keep track of like bad neurons. So we can, uh, I think Vivian and her work is keeping track of that to make sure that that situation is not happening. And you don't get to the point that uh, that neuron is never going to fire again. Okay. Uh, Akash, is this the last slide? We have more. Yeah, this is the last slide. Okay, uh, we should move on to Vivian, otherwise we don't have uh, a lot of time. Thanks, yeah. Akash. Thanks, Akash. Yeah, of course. Uh, all right, let me share my screen. Um, how long do we have until we have another half hour? Yeah, let's say 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay, all right, I'll be quick. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. All right, um, yeah, just a quick uh, general motivation of the project I'm working on. Um, I just put this quote that's been quoted very often recently from Alan Turing. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would up obtain the adult brain. Um, so how does the child's mind look like and how do children actually learn? Um, uh, just as a very simplified version, I drew the stages of cognitive development according to Piaget here. And the main message is basically that children learn over a long period of time and learn gradually more and more complex tasks. And particularly in the first years, they learn very unsupervised. They usually don't have an explicit goal of what they need to do or get rewarded for doing specific things. Um, and they mostly just uh, curiously interact with the environment um, and learn sensory motor contingencies and um, things like object impermanence and just um, general knowledge about the world. And then later on, they learn to attach words and meaning to certain objects. And um, after many years, they learn um, uh, inductive and deductive reasoning and abstract thought and so on. But it takes a long time. And if we compare it to how machines often learn, there's often um, very dense supervision. So. After every example, of, for example, uh, someone tells you if this was this image was correctly classified or not, what was actually the correct answer. Um, often they also don't have a body, so they don't really interact with the world. That's of course usually not the case with reinforcement learning, but with fully supervised learning, for example, image classification. Um, and there's usually not gradual knowledge acquisition. So you start with the final task that should be solved. So you say, okay, uh, tell me if this is a cat or a dog. And this is all the network is doing. Um, 
And what I'm trying to do is kind of look at these three factors, supervision, embodiment, and gradual knowledge acquisition, and try to implement them a bit more yeah, childlike in a machine with the idea that um, first there's very unsupervised exploration. Um, and during this time, um, a robust model of the world is learned without actually having a specific task or even multiple explicit tasks that you get rewarded for but just kind of a curious exploration. And then based on this representation that is learned, you can then take just few examples or demonstrations of a task and learn it uh, rather quickly. Um, I'll just skip this. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll just skip that too. So this is basically from my previous work with an agent that learns with curiosity to navigate this um, tower environment and I basically showed that meaningful representations are learned even without a specific task and you can then do few short learning for example here um, I show object classification with just um, yeah just one example is already above chance and um, the more examples you show uh, the better it gets so the idea seems to have some merit at least but um, now the, to the to get to the project, um, basically I'm trying to look at an environment that is actually more based on interaction. So this tower was mostly a navigation environment, and it was also an episodic environment. So after every few thousand frames, it would get reset again. And um, now the environment I'm looking at is uh, also a robotic arm, um, but compared to a cars project, it actually uses mostly visual observations. So on the right, you can see the, yeah, it's called the retina of the robot, uh, what the robot actually sees. It's a RGB image. Um, and yeah, this is the, the arm. It has, Just a quick yeah. question there <laughs> on the RGB image, it, it looked like the viewpoint is very weird because when the gripper is on top of the object, you can't actually see the gripper. So it may be yeah. hard to actually tell where it is. Uh, yeah, that's actually a one concern that, that we have at the moment, um, that the viewpoint is maybe not the most useful viewpoint. Um, but- uh, In fact, it's hard to, to imagine a worse viewpoint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost uh, any other viewpoint would be better unless it's under the table or something. <laughs> yeah. So this is like the default environment from the setup. Um, and I have to look into the like the rendering engine if maybe we can place the camera somewhere else. But yeah, I, I agree it's not the best viewpoint actually. But it's also like a little bit more realistic. Like if you are a human being, you're looking down and you're picking up on something. Let's say I don't know. I think I, very rarely am I looking, you know, right at top of my hand while I'm trying to do an obscuring, you know, most of the time my hand is in front of me and I can see exactly what's going on. Yeah. And yeah. plus I have proprioception, proper, plus yeah. I have proprioception exactly. and touch and feeling and all that stuff. So I have many sensors going on. Yeah, exactly. Because here, this is the only sensor. If I don't see what I'm looking at, I rely on proprioception and touch. Uh, yeah, all I have is vision. It's really hard. Yeah, what, right. What, what would be ideal, what I would ideally have is an egocentric viewpoint that can actually change with the robot arm. Um, we do have touch sensors actually, so it's it's not just the visual input, but also um, touch, um, but it's- Oh, that's good, yeah. Not that, uh, it's just four sensors, so not super informative. Um, yeah, but I, I have to look into that if it's somehow possible to change the camera to be maybe on the arm or something. Yeah, or like even that. just off to the side a little bit or you know something yeah. so you can see what's going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this is all the observations that one has access to. There's the RGB image and a depth image a mask of what kind of objects are visible and you can provide a goal image um, and then the joint positions, touch sensors, object positions and goal mask and positions. And usually 
the robot is supposed to only learn using the retina image and the touch sensors. And the rest is more for uh, experiments and um, testing and evaluation and so on. And basically the idea is that there's a really long exploration phase, 15 million steps are not really long, but compared to the next two phases, it's long. And during the exploration phase, there are no rewards and no goal states. Um, so, and, it, and in how I set it up, it's also not reset. So it's kind of a continual learning for a long period of time with no explicit goal. And the, my goal is uh, that, the, um, that the arm learns through some intrinsic uh, motivation to interact with the object and learn a general representation of them. So how can you interact with objects in general? Um, how do they look from different angles and so on? And then there's a very short training phase, 10,000 steps where um, goal states are provided as images. So RGB image from the same top view of how the object should be arranged. And then the arm is supposed to rearrange the objects on the table and the shelf to match the goal, goal image. And the reward is then the distance of the object to their goal position. Um, and then there's an evaluation of this task. And in general, um, so this was part of a challenge. Um, but in general, I would like to also test different kinds of tasks afterwards, um, all with a very short training period and uh, evaluation. For example, you could test um, few shot object detection and um, any, you, you could test novel kind of objects and so on. Um, but then, so the main question is how, how would you learn in this really long period without any goals or rewards? Um, and for this, I'll just quickly go through the general reinforcement learning setup. Um, so in general, there's the environment, you get an observation. The observation is then encoded into a representation, uh, in this case, using a neural network. Um, and then based on the representation, um, there's a policy which uh, decides on an action that is performed and a value estimate, which is basically an estimate of how good uh, the current state is. So how much a future reward do we expect when we are in this state? And then the action is sent back to the environment and um, leads to the next observation and could lead to reward. And usually then this reward is used uh, to train uh, the, the whole network and policy. And uh, I use an actor critic um, uh, specifically a PPO uh, to train to train this. But uh, what if there are no rewards? So uh, here, um, Deepak Pasak in 2017 proposed this idea of uh, curiosity. Um, basically, you take the current observation and the next observation, and you encode both of them, again, with a neural network, or um, whatever you can ring encoded randomly, for example, as well. Um, and then you there's a forward model, which takes the action and the current observation, and then it's supposed to predict what would be the next observation. So I see this, I perform that action, what will I see next? And that is called the forward loss, the difference between this prediction and the actual next observation. And then there's also an inverse model um, it uh, receives the current observation and the next observation and is supposed to predict the action that was performed in between. And this is called the inverse loss and the inverse loss is ma mainly used to make sure that this light blue uh, encoding network actually learns action relevant information. So um, the example is for uh, like leaves that blow in the wind would uh, generally be super interesting because they're very unpredictable. So you would just keep looking at them. Um, uh, but we only want to encode information that is actually, can actually be influenced by our own actions and um, is relevant in that regard. 
there is a, a um, famous example. Sorry, uh, there is a famous example of the static TV, right? There is a yeah. <laughs> Like they put yeah. the agent with just a forward model, and then you put a TV, and TV is just like showing like randomness, the static noise, and that would just break the regular uh, agent with the forward model if you don't include the inverse model. Yeah, so, yeah. So much so, innovation so, is going on in the TV. <laughs> yeah, so that that case actually also breaks this this version of it because um, the TV actually you, you press a button in order to see the next screen, which is a random screen, so very unpredictable. But since it is not just a random uh, TV screen, so not just random noise, uh, but you, it's actually action induced to see the next screen, uh, it, it actually also tricks this version of, of the model. Um, but uh, for example, random noise or stuff like that has, not, has no effect on, on it or not, no strong effect. But it's it's a really uh, funny example of that the TV screen can just be intrinsically so interesting. Uh, it can happen with us as well, right? Like if this is yeah, like uh, so different than the TV. We might as well just you know like be there. Like what's going to happen? <laughs> so, the humans are not immune to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I have a quick question. I'm a little confused by some of these arrows here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you get an observation, I'm just looking at the forward model piece, and the forward model is is trying to predict the next observation is that yeah or, or the current uh, it, it's not just reconstructing the current one, it's predicting the next observation. Yeah, um, exactly. Okay, and then and when you compute the error there, what actually gets updated? Uh, I, I'll get to that uh, okay. in a moment. Okay. So, um, so basically, first of all, the prediction is always done in feature space, so not on the raw images, yeah. but yeah. on the on the encoding, um, and then the loss is basically, um, yeah, the difference between between the two, um, and then the forward loss and the inverse loss are both used to optimize the light blue part. So the light blue part here tries to minimize the forward loss and the inverse loss. So it tries to okay. make as good predictions as possible on the next observation and on the action. Um, so the, the goal is basically to create these representations that are very informative of the next observation and the action itself. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. In, in, these, in the forward and inverse model, the goal is to, to make very good predictions about the world. Yeah. Um, okay. And so you can kind of see the light blue part as a, a model of the world um, that tries to, to make these predictions all the time about the world and tries to encode the most important information for that. But then the dark blue part, so the part that's actually responsible for the policy and acting in the environment. So, and this is the trick for the curiosity. It actually takes the forward loss as a reward. So it actually tries to increase the forward loss. And so to imagine why this works, basically um, the dark blue network gets rewarded for performing actions that lead to unexpected observations. So observations where the light blue network makes high um, errors in its predictions. So if the agent would, for example, always just stand in front of a wall, the light blue network would quickly make very, very good predictions. And then the dark blue network gets very little reward. So it needs to start acting differently. And it needs to start turning around and exploring the room. And after a while, this room is then also um, very predictable for the agent. And it starts to leave the room and explore um, more parts. And uh, where this uh, work was actually first demonstrated was on Mario, um, Super Mario. And there it can, for example, solve these levels without getting any rewards or high scores, just out of yeah, curiosity because it wants to see new things. And if it dies, for example, it goes back to the starting screen, which again is super predictable and leads to very low rewards. So it, it does not want to die and it wants to see further parts of the level. And uh, that's, that's the whole uh, trick there. So it's kind of a competing process. The dark blue network tries to increase the forward loss and the, by its actions, 
and the Live Zoo network tries to adapt the model to make better predictions again. So it's seeking novelty. Exactly. For un unpredictableness. Um, okay. Is that so far clear? I'm almost almost through. Okay, so um, we can see the um, inverse model as kind of just a way to enforce a specific encoding in this uh, light blue network. So I will just um, summarize it as auxiliary task or loss. And this can also be, for example, it also works if you just take a network and freeze the random weights or you can use an ultra encoder or something else to learn this representation. Um, and now uh, this is an extension of, of the curiosity. It's called exploration by disagreement. And instead of having one forward model, you have uh, five or 10 or however many forward models. They all have the same task of predicting the next observation. And they all have uh, tried to minimize the forward loss. And now the internal reward is actually the disagreement between the predictions. And the idea here is um, if we're in a very uh, familiar stage, all of the forward models are, are going to make pretty similar predictions about the next observation. But if we're in a quite novel stage, the forward models don't really know what to do yet and their predictions will be quite different. And that will then be a, a sign of being in a novel interesting state, which is the reward for the network. Um, and yeah, the, the good thing about the setup also is that, that now um, the whole reward setup is actually intrinsic in the network now and not anymore dependent on the environment. So usually the agent doesn't have access to the reward function. Um, but in this case, we actually kind of have the reward function in there and now we can theoretically get rid of this reward and actually do back propagation through the entire um, through the entire network and make use of the stuff that we learned in the models um, to decide actions that actively go in directions that the models are uncertain about at the moment. Um, and that's a, that's a so so far we have implemented uh, this part here. Um, and rep replicated the results of, of the paper on some Atari games um, the, and the implementing the backpropagation through the whole network, which would make the learning a lot more efficient and faster is still a, a step to do. Um, and in general, um, right now I'm trying to get it to learn a good representation through the SAS supervised exploration and interaction and then um, once this is possible, which is actually quite hard because it has all the all the diff all the problems of reinforcement learning of taking super long for, to learn, and additionally having these high dimensional visual observations, which make it take even longer, and also not having explicit goals or these dense informative rewards. So it is quite difficult to get that blue part right, but hopefully once we get that there will be really nice generalization capabilities to a range of different tasks based on these representations. Um, Is this also part of your PhD thesis? Uh, this um, yeah, so th the work uh, on the obstacle tower, which kind of has the same concept, just with more navigation and um, episodic tasks, um, Part of my thesis definitely in this kind of a natural extension of it. I'm not sure if it will be published in time to actually be included in the <laughs> dissertation, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a natural extension of it. And Vivian, uh, before you move on, can you go back just one slide? Yeah. Just a point I wanted to make is that there is an interesting uh, idea that the thousand brains that when we think about voting, we usually think about kind of taking the mean of those predictions and see what they agree with. But there is a lot of information in what they disagree as well, 
right? And, and that's what this model is doing, is using the, the, the variance and, and the amount of their disagreement to decide what, we, what is novel and what is not novel. And then it uses that to drive exploration. So that, that's something we could also uh, include uh, in the way we implement the theory. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sorry. Go, go ahead and answer his question. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, yeah, see a lot of parallels here also with the thousand brain theory. And I also see a lot of options where we can include more of these um, elements. Um, like, yeah, like you say, voting, for example, and it's like the same signal can be reward for one part of the network and lost for another part. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, a lot of different interesting directions to go in. So, so one question I had was, uh, um, how would the network distinguish between your blowing leaves model where it's chaotic and unpredictable and you would you would focus on trying to predict something that's not predictable to say a visual puzzle that's that's dynamic that's being presented as a solution to open up the next door how does it you know kind of decide to give up on something as it's i'm, I'm just not going to be able to predict this thing and i move on to something else um So basically, the thought is that, so with some things, it's, it's really that it can be tricked by these uh, inherently interesting random phenomena. Um, and you can't really do much about that. But the goal of these um, auxiliary losses is to encode information that, that is all extra relevant and just not encode these random leaf movements. For example, if you have a tree that you just don't encode all of the small leaf movements, but only um, your movement relative to the tree as a, as a whole object. And then if this information is not in the feature vector itself, it, it can't c confuse the forward model anymore. But, and it seems to work well with random noise, for example, to, to kind of disregard that. Um, with a with a task itself, if it's actually a task that is influenced by the actions of the of the um, robot or agent, then this this information should be encoded in the feature vector, um, and therefore also needs to be predicted with the forward model. And in the beginning, when it starts out, it, everything is super interesting and everything is quite rewarding, but then over time, the model should get better and better, and only uh, more complex behaviors that lead uh, lead to really novel observations anymore. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it, it does. I was just looking at the. In, in some sense, you want to encode a, a you know sense of fertility that it's it's in the sense that this thing is not resolving. I need to explore elsewhere or something else that it's over after some number of iterations, I'm not going to get it. So maybe, you know, try someplace else. So yeah. if I understood correctly, just uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So you're saying there are two ways of kind of solving the problem Kevin raised. One is in phi prime where you encode the observation, uh, there's going to be, it's going to be abstract away with time. So you're not going to see that noise. And the other way would be through the inverse model and the inverse model guarantee that you only care about, uh, you only care about that, uh, that difference, that novelty, if it's driven by your action. If it's not driven by your actions, just like stochastic noise, you wouldn't care about it. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, yeah. And those can be the same thing basically, so. If you like the inverse model can can be the thing that enforces this, this specific encoding. That oh, I see. I see. Got it. Okay, because the laws is being used to to update that uh, the phi prime model there, right? Yeah. Okay. And then and you're call, you're not calling it a model, but that's actually a model in itself, right? That feature encoder phi prime, it's actually also kind of a model, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Maybe another way of phrasing what Kevin was saying is that you want to be able to just estimate the Bayes error rate for what you're doing. So if you're trying to predict what the next thing will be, if the error rate is like inherently low, um, like it's very easy to predict what's next, that's uninteresting, but it's also uninteresting if there's not very much progress to be made. Yeah, yeah, and that is kind of done uh, in the reinforcement learning part of it. So you, we have this value estimate, and if the value estimate is, uh, the value estimate kind of learns the space rate, and then only what is, so, so from this you can calculate the advantage, which is kind of how much better was this action than I expected it to be. Um, so I think that kind of does what you just describe. That it only learns from the examples that are actually better than the than what usually happens reward wise. In this architecture, the forward models are all getting the exact same input, right? Um, uh, yes. So yeah, that was a bit strange. In the paper, they say they do bootstrapping and only show uh, show different examples to every model, but they actually just use dropout for each model to have some variety, but uh, to be more uh, data efficient because it's just so computationally expensive to collect all these observations and simulate mm. the environment um, that you want to make use of all of the observations all the time. Yeah, because without something else, it seems like the forward models would very quickly converge to the same yeah. Same thing. I wonder if you've thought about giving different subsets of the representation to each forward model. Um, you know, yeah, if that, you think about these, it's almost like cortical columns. Each cortical column gets very different sensory input. Yeah, that is actually one of my ideas that that we could uh, like split up this representation, and every forward model is only uh, responsible for part of part of the observation space. Um, that, that's being done, but in kind of a random fashion with the dropout. Uh, what you, we don't guarantee right now is that uh, each time, if you just do like a random dropout, the forward model is going to access like a subset of the observation, but that subset is going to change. If you want to make it more uh, cortical columns like, then, then we could like just fix what grain, what part of the observation space each element to have access. Yeah, because with dropout or random thing, the, the, you're essentially still saying the whole thing is just a noisy version of the thing. But maybe if you subset it, each forward model could become very specialized to one part of it. Um, and it could also learn much faster because it's um, you know only seeing a small subset of the input. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be a really cool thing to do. And also, for example, have a model for, for the touch sensors um, and for different types of observations. Mm -hmm. I, I could think of one thing where you, you know, the image, uh, it's separated into two pieces, like the area immediately around its visualization of where the gripper is and the background. So it's, those are getting different inputs and they have different relationships, the, the, the um, uh, different contexts. So they might produce, you know, interesting different results. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be a really interesting thing to try try out. Um, okay, I think we're so just so yeah, just as an outlook. Um, of course, after this very simplistic robot arm environment, one can also go to more complex environments like I Gibson, where it's actually quite realistic. Um, apartment environment with interaction with all kinds of furniture and objects and uh, one can also transfer it to the real world of course but that's uh, kind of far out because it's already hard to get it to learn something in this really simple table environment <laughs> and yeah that's it in, in your so this is this is something you're still setting up and running. Don't have any results or anything yet, right? Um, yeah, I have some some results, but nothing that actually really.
starts to interact with the objects and picks them up or anything like that. Um, I have the problem right now that some of in some of the runs it just figures out kind of a local minimum where it, the arm completely stops moving, um, which uh, yeah decreases the prediction error of course. But um, I have to see if I somehow need to weigh the internal rewards some more or um, why this is happening. Um, but yes, it, it learns stuff and it gets the predict the prediction error goes down and everything. But it uh, and it, it works in the in the Atari games, for example, um, where you have ep an episodic setup. But here it doesn't start picking up objects or anything yet. And also like things like the action space and everything, I'm still working on how to best specify it. Originally it's a continuous action space, but that's uh, in general really difficult to learn with reinforcement learning. Uh, so I'm discretizing the actions and seeing what works best. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm playing around with at the moment. Yeah, there was a, one funny result I think you mentioned when you try to encourage uh, touch to see if it would help a big and but just the arm would just go and grab the table and just stay there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I tried. Uh, yeah, if it helps to actually give a reward for touching things, and uh, yeah, it just went like this. And then it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the video is pretty funny. It's just like, and then it's, it just stays there. Uh, which obviously maximizes the touch reward, but uh, it's not what we want. <laughs> it's interesting because these are all unsupervised, right? So we're like trying to find this scheme where you know the agent learns the correct movement, so then we can transfer that to downstream task. But it's a uh, it, it's a very uh, hard task. Yeah, yeah, it's hard hard to specify how it should like. Yeah, what should be the goal? What should the goal be? Uh, I mean, curious things can happen with a lot of different movements. So, so yeah, still have to work on getting it all right. I, I, was, I was thinking uh, along those lines. If you have okay, so you said touch was going to be rewarded, but throw that novelty factor, and it says. Okay, I've touched this long enough. Uh, let's touch something else, and so the whole thing is kind of grabby around the whole environment. <laughs> but it, it only has, I think, the touch sensor is only uh, like pressure, right? So I don't think it knows whether it's touching something else. Does it? Yeah, it's just a force sensor. But actually, at the moment, I'm not even using the touch uh, information in the observations right now. I'm just trying the visual observations. So I think it might actually help to include the touch information. Uh, just in the observations, not not even as a reward, because yeah, even if it's just in the observation, it can be leading to a curiosity reward. Yeah, eventually it learns it can push things over. Yeah, it can learn it can like swipe things off the table. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get in that childlike state. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pushing over the, the towers and everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cat, cats are the same thing. They just push something off the table to see what it looks like when it falls down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're measuring the progress in like how many years old the agent is right now, it's like four months. Our goal is to get to one year by you know, <laughs> the next. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, interesting when your measure of prog progress is if your robot is pushing things off the table or not. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was one of the um, analogies. There was a uh, kind of paper by uh, um, uh, by Marr, where they were talking about the cerebellar cortex, and his belief was that it learned by reducing the network. You know, the connect connectivity of the network. And so the analogy was, if you look at a baby trying to figure out what its arm is doing, 
and it has an objective to go and touch something, it's going to swing and miss, swing and miss. And over time, it learns to kind of trim the network so that it actually can hit what or touch whatever it is that it was seeking for. And then you know, it displaces and it, so basically it starts learning the configuration space of what it needs to do in order to touch something. And so that's the, and, and the, I mean, the notion was, was, was that by basically trimming away the, the, the network and the cere uh, um, cerebellar cortex, you started learning these motions, you know? So reaching out and touching in the space is actually an interesting set of goals. And when it starts learning and says, I have an objective, what do I need to do to get from A to B, you know? So just let it go overnight, pushing things around. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for, for like, uh, yeah, almost two years now, just having your robot learn overnight and day and being curious. And it's uh, interesting what you can learn just with that objective, like navigating this tower environment, for example, um, just out of curiosity. And yeah, like in children, for example, uh, it was shown they they actually um, yeah don't take uh, immediate reward in order to seek out more information about the world. Often, so it seems like curiosity actually plays quite an important part in children's learning. But of course, it's like the timescales of these experiments are, even if you say yeah, it takes three days to learn, it's still compared to children who t take years to learn and they have so many extra mechanisms like imitation learning and, and all of this uh, optimization. And uh, yeah, it's, for, for a curious agent to learn something within a few days is actually quite impressive, I think. 